Good morning, everyone. It's time to get started. If you want to go ahead and turn to John chapter 7, we're going to be picking up in John chapter 7, where we left off. We looked at the questions, finally, for chapter 6 on Wednesday, and now we're going to be getting into chapter 7. Now, um, uh, I will just say, I don't know the sermon PowerPoint, everything came through just fine, but for some reason... It's just the last couple slides. The first few slides, I think, are I, I'm, I'm proud of those. But the last couple slides, I don't know why, but they just didn't transfer. It's probably a issue with uh, the superior Apple products going to inferior <laughs> other products. But no, uh, I don't know. Some some of the, I guess, fonts or, or something just doesn't transfer over very well. So I did end up putting a couple extra slides at the end just so that way there'd be some supplemental uh uh, points up on the charts as we go throughout the study uh, through John chapter 7, but I just want to let you know that before we got to that point. A lot less information than usual uh, on the last couple of slides. But before we get into the Bible study, we're going to start with a word of prayer, and Stephen said that he would lead us in that prayer. Amen. All righty. So beginning in John chapter 7 in verse 1, um, just a couple things here that I think are interesting. Does, well, before we get into any of that, does anyone know uh, much about the Feast of Booths that maybe they'd like to share? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I, I, well, I mean, everyone was going to Jerusalem, and, and they were commemorating something specific. Do you know what that was? Sorry? Yeah, so it's definitely something from the Old Testament. Does anyone's translation use a different word other than booths? That's the New American Standard. It says the Feast of Booths, but does anybody else have a different word there? Feast of Tabernacles. And so does that kind of help ring a bell? What was it to commemorate for the Israelites uh, of old, particularly in the wilderness? If you want to take a guess, it... so there. The, the, uh, one more time. I, I... Okay, so it does have to do with tabernacles, as particularly plural. Um, they and another, the idea of a tabernacle. It's really a tent uh, to a degree. Now, the tabernacle that housed the thing of things of the Lord, like the, the Ark of the Covenant, that was more extravagant. It was certainly more glorious to behold. It was going to be much better and much nicer than the rest of the tents that the rest of the Israelites would abide in. But the Feast of Booze was really just a, a time that they commemorated the, the, the Israelites of old, their forefathers that had to go throughout the wilderness that did not have um, the promised land just yet. And it was commemorating the fact that they had to live in tabernacles. They had to live in tents. They didn't have a place to call home for quite some time. And then it was supposed to remind them of some things that I think particularly you find in the book of Deuteronomy. God says over and over again that when you get to the promised land, you need to remember this, remember this, remember this. And I think this is one of those instances where God uh, institutes something for the Israelites where this was a good way for them to remember those things that he said you need to not just remember once you get there, but after you have attained the promised land and all of these beautiful blessings I'm going to bestow upon you, don't forget these things, that you did not get this uh, to this promised land by yourself. And it was supposed to be for all of these descendants of, of even that generation to remember these things. Now, in these first few verses here, verses 1 through 9, uh, what do we learn about Jesus' brothers? Or maybe just the relationship that he had with them at this point, or they had with him at this point. Yeah, I mean, very, very clearly, 
they did not believe in Jesus the way the, the apostles did. Uh, Peter, just at the end of chapter 6, has made a pretty significant confession, uh, and even to a public degree, about Jesus and who Jesus is, being the Christ and being the one who uh, has the words of eternal life. His brothers were not so... They weren't so keen on admitting something like that. In fact, they I would say that by their words, they just simply don't believe in any of that. Um, looking at this discussion here, it says in verse 3, His brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers were believing in him. Uh, and, and then it, Jesus answers, my time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it, that its deeds are evil. And so it tells them to go up to the feast themselves, that it wasn't not his time yet. Now, what does, uh, well, before we get into this, is there anything else that anybody wants to add to that? We'll kind of come back to it about this relationship between his brothers. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. 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 And and so it's kind of like what we talked about on Wednesday a little bit. I can't there were some there were several comments made about this, but there are just so many instances where Jesus really parallels a lot of Old Testament characters and Joseph especially here because even his own family they just they won't accept this and and they're not willing to accept that he is who uh who he's proving himself to be, even through all of these signs and these works that he's doing, they're just unwilling to accept it. Um, now, yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, and I mean, uh, I <laughs> obviously the the brothers don't. We're not told that they ever put their hand against Jesus, but they certainly, in their taunting him, well, why don't you just go down? I think even they probably knew the hostility that Jesus was receiving from the Pharisees, and well, even not just the Pharisees, but a lot of the Jews that there was much opposition against Jesus, and that Jesus has already had to kind of not flee certain situations, but just kind of leave a certain situation because it, people were getting so frustrated and angry that they were going to want to seize him and try to kill him. And so he gets out of that because he's not going to die on just some random, in some random place. Uh, he has a date set with Calvary. Um, and so, uh, yes, there are so many significant parallels to that. Now, with his bro brothers specifically, his brothers, is this going to remain the case with all of them? Or is it going to, is something going to change, at least with maybe one of them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And what were you going to say? Yes. And so, yeah, one of them is going to become a, not only become a Christian, but he's going to be one of the inspired writers. And he's even going to be a very prominent, being an inspired writer, he's going to be a very prominent Christian in the first century. And so I do think it's interesting to note that it doesn't say anything about that in this passage, but it is helpful to note the beginnings of where maybe some of these relationships start and how they progress and how they develop. In some cases, devolve, but in a lot of cases, develop into a right, correct, appropriate uh, relationship. And so while it may be this way at the beginning, at least for one of them, it does not stay this way. And I think that that's, um, I think there's some good encouragement to take from that. Uh, now, coming down to what we just read in those past couple verses, where he talks about how the world hates him, uh, it, or it doesn't hate them, but it hates him because he testifies of it that its deeds are evil. Why does the world hate Jesus? By his own words. Yeah, because he says he's the son of God. What else? Yes. 
Yes, and and we'll get even more into that because I think he really kind of points to one place in particular to make that case. But uh, let me just pause for a second and say, I, I think it's helpful. I know that we, when I ask that question, you could just say, well, because he testifies of its deeds and its deeds are evil. And it's easy to just repeat the same thing. But it is very helpful to think about what, what are some of the applications that Jesus is trying to make to these people? And so when you think about what he says, then that can develop into, okay, what does that mean for this group individually or specifically? And then what does that mean for me? And what does it mean for all people, even in the 21st century? So I appreciate that answer because it's, 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 it's looking at what Jesus says, using that answer to develop into uh, some deeper application. And really, one of the main applications that these people in particular had to make was they weren't doing what they said they were doing. We are absolutely students of Moses. But no, they're not. Because if they were, they would recognize who Jesus was just by seeing his, his not even just the signs that he does, but just his teaching and what, what he embodies, what he emulates, which, it, which is God's law. Um, and so uh, very, very good um, answer. I like that a lot. Uh, any, anything to add to that or anything else? And they're even going to try to bring up some things to say that that doesn't even that doesn't even make sense for this man to say that he's the Messiah or the Son of God because we know where he comes from. And, and again, we'll we'll see that more in just a moment. But if you want to turn very quickly to John chapter fifteen, just a few pages over, John chapter fifteen, and this is during um, Jesus's prayer and even more teaching that he's giving to the disciples as he's approaching the cross. And in John 15, right after he talks about he is the true vine, the Father is the vine dresser, and every branch in him, uh, if you want to be a part of him, abide in him, you have to be uh, a branch that stems from him. But then you get to verse 18 as he's talking about the relationship that we're supposed to have with God, the relationship we're supposed to have with our brethren, and then the relationship we're supposed to have with the world. It harkens back to what is said in John chapter 7, just in this discussion between Jesus and his brothers. In verse 18 of John chapter 15, does someone want to read? um, Well, let's go ahead and read verses 18 through 19, please. All right, very good. So we already have seen in John chapter 7 why the world hates Jesus, because, it test, because he testifies of the world's deeds, and it's deeds of darkness, as Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 5. It's deeds that God's people cannot participate with, have association with, or have fellowship with. And so with that being said, what, how does that translate to those that follow him? Yeah, so avoid the same error of, of those deeds of darkness. What else? Yes. Exactly. So as disciples of Christ, what does disciple mean? A follower, a student. And particularly as a follower, that means you're going to look like Jesus, doesn't it? And if we look like Jesus, that means we're going to talk like him. We're going to say the same things as him. And in, and in just being like him, it's going to invite the same kind of opposition. Was Somebody else started saying that. Was it you? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. And even beyond that, it almost seems like he's saying they can't hate you because, I mean, you have some level of association with it. I mean, they were Jews, but obviously they, I mean, they were not just 
unbelieving, but they were contemptible with, with the Messiah, with Jesus. And so I, I think one of the reasons that the world doesn't hate them, at least at this point, and I know it doesn't stay this way, at least with James, but at least at this point, the reason the world doesn't hate them is because right now they're acting just like the rest of the world. I think that that's pretty telling, even for 21st century Christians. If we blend in with the world, and if we, um, and let me just put a disclaimer here. I'm not saying <laughs> that our goal as Christians is to be as contemptible as possible, and we're trying to make people angry, and just we're just trying to be offensive. I'm not saying this. But if we blend in very well with the world and there's never any opposition that comes our way, what does that say about our discipleship? What does it probably say about our discipleship? Yeah, we're not followers of Jesus or we're not following him very well. We may say that we're his disciples, but if we're not speaking, like, if we speak like him and we look like him just by our example alone, even, don't even think about the words that we're going to speak, but just by our example alone, isn't that going to cause some contention between us and the rest of the world? How might that occur? How might that come up? What might that look like from time to time? Yeah. Yeah. I remember there was, going right along the line with that, some of the things that we prioritize is not what the world prioritizes. Um, and some of the things we do is not what the world does. Some of the things we don't do is exactly what the world does. I remember there was a couple who they had friends. They weren't Christians. And they were all supposed to be going on a cruise. Uh, I think it was a cruise. And then these Christian, this Christian couple, they talked to the rest of their friends. And they said, well, I mean, what is the schedule of this cruise? Because we're going to have to worship on Sunday. And they're like, I mean... Can't you miss just can't you miss just one service? Can't you miss just this one Sunday? And they're like, well, no, that's not how we do things. We're we're Christians. This is what God expects of us, this is what God commands of us. So we are going to be there. And I mean, it didn't cause that big of a disagreement, I mean, but it did cause some consternation because these people were like, why do we even have to put ourselves through this? They ended up going because they they were able to figure it out, but there was a level of, if we can't figure this out, we're just not going to be able to go. I mean, you guys can still go. We're not going to keep you from it, but, but we're not going to be able to go because we're going to be at services on Sunday. And, I mean, the, their friends looked at that and thought, that's, that's ridiculous. That's silly. I mean, that just seems so, it just seems like overkill. But for disciples, it doesn't even have to be something you say. It's just something that you are loyal to or that you are steadfast in, and only that can cause or just that can cause great uh, conflict. Now, again, it didn't, it didn't arise to such a degree that there was bloodshed. I'm not saying that, but it did cause some conflict. And so uh, that, that's just one way that, that it can definitely come up. Any other thoughts on that or any other examples maybe? Yes. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and it is interesting how many times, especially John, will talk about the time of Jesus, or, or um, what's the term? I'm actually, it's literally in the sermon this morning. It's, um, it's uh, my, my hour, or th that Jesus' hour had not yet come. And you know exactly what he's talking about when he says that hour. It's a very specific hour that he's talking about, very specific time that he's talking about. Um, and Jesus has this in mind the entire, uh, his entire life and with every single action. This isn't some random uh, 
this isn't just in the back of his head. This is always at the forefront. Uh, okay, so any other thoughts on that before we continue on? All right, now, if you could turn to 1 John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, just one last thing that I would mention about this, about the world and Christians in it, or Jesus' disciples in it. 1 John chapter 3, can someone read verses 11 through 13 for us? 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. All right. And so there's a lot that John in throughout his writings in the gospel, John first, second and third John in his epistles will say about love and hate, especially kind of his opposites. But in this case, in specifically in verse 12, he brings up Cain and Abel as an example. And he says that there was a reason that Cain slayed Abel. Why was it? Because he was evil and his brother was righteous. And I think that this, this just kind of, uh, we won't spend too much time on this because we just kind of went through some examples of what this looks like. But I think this is a very good biblical example of what is happening. Just like what Jesus says in John chapter 3 in verses 19 through 21, the light, or the light exposes the darkness and the darkness does not like the light because it does expose. It, it disperses the shadows and therefore you see everything in full view. Just the word expose, it's very uncomfortable. Because it means that everything is seen. Nothing can be hidden anymore. And uh, with Jesus, that light that comes, the light of men, obviously there's going to be some hatred and there's going to be some contempt. And again, it doesn't just have to be in words. It can just be in the very example that we are. We're supposed to be a city set on a hill, a beacon in a world of darkness. And that is going to invite uh, hatred to say the least. And so... Um, again, I don't want to go too far into that because we kind of went through some good examples of what that looks like um, in the previous question. But any other thoughts before we move on in the text? All right, well, continuing on in John 7, in verse 10, it says, But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as if in secret. So the Jews were seeking him at the feast and were saying, Where is he? There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying he is a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. Yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, I just want to make this one point as we continue on, because this is leading us into another uh, part of the passage. But I think it's interesting that you see several times throughout the ministry of Jesus that there, even with people that believe in him, not just with people that despise him, which is also interesting, but even with people that believe in him, there's this level of still not full developed faith because there's a good level of doubt and there's a good seed of, of fear and particularly of the Pharisees, of the synagogue being thrown out of the synagogue. We'll see again in John, John chapter nine, but, I do think that it's needed to point this out from time to time when you look throughout just the ministry of Jesus, not even just in the book of Acts. But people are starting to believe in him, and they're even starting to profess certain true things about him. But they're still silent. And um, to be a disciple of Jesus, as you see, especially with the apostles, those that were following after him very closely, the 12 uh, chosen, they were not so silent about it. doesn't mean they were perfect. But if we really want to be a true disciple, uh, we're not going to be able to have these these kinds of these kinds of discussions where, okay, I think I believe, but I'm, you know, Nicodemus, and again, we're going to see Nicodemus in John chapter seven, but even him, he shows some good insight to the scriptures and good insight about Jesus. He proclaims something very true about Jesus. No one can do these things unless they are with God, unless God has sent them. And yet, even at this point. He does go a bit further, but he's still kind of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Re retreated. And that can't be the way for, for true disciples of Christ. And so, did want to mention that before we moved on. Any other thoughts on that before we get into verses uh, 14 and onward? Okay, so beginning in John chapter 7 and verse 14. All right. 
good. Everything's still coming up the proper way. John chapter 7, can someone, uh, just one person, we'll go uh, one at a time, but can someone read verses 14 through 18, please? Thank you. Very good. Now, can someone else pick up in verse 19 and read through verse 31? Verses 19 through 31. All right, very good. Thank you uh, both. Now, we broke it up uh, just because it's kind of lengthy, but I did want to get it all together because I think all of this goes together. Um, this is all part of, I think, one main argument. Now, in verse, just through verses 14 through 18, what does Jesus say uh, about his teaching in verses 14 through 18? It's not my own. Who's it? It's God's. It's his father's. And we can already, we can look at back at some of the other passages just in John uh, that we've already read where he makes this very same claim. And it does, it is, I will just say a brief pause. It is kind of striking to me, particularly in John. He, he's saying the same things over and over and, and maybe not necessarily the exact same wording, but he really is saying the same kind of things. And, and, um, I think sometimes it's easy to maybe get kind of bored when there's repetition, but especially when you look at the context and you look at the cultural conflict here, there's a reason that he has to keep coming back to certain things. These individuals were struggling with the teaching of Jesus, and they did not want to accept it because it was difficult on them. But they needed to because it wasn't just teaching from just some random person for some random reason. It was teaching from Jesus that was ultimately from the Father because he came from the Father, which is just another thing that, that is said over and over again in, in just the Gospel of John alone. Um, and so that's one of the main things that we have to pick up about this, that, that Jesus is repeating incessantly that my teaching is not my own, but his who sent me. Now, um, well, before I get to some of the more some of these specific questions that I just thought up, what are some things that you picked up in in just these four verses here that maybe you think is important, too important to not speak of? 
Yeah. And I mean, the Pharisees especially would be guilty of that very thing. Not, well, not what Jesus was doing, but the opposite of what he, what you just said. They, they did things just to get the glory right at that moment. And you think about the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter six, how are a couple ways that they did that? They would go out in public and they would cry out these nice, eloquent prayers that everybody could hear. Oh, wow, look how pious and devoted he is. They were getting their glory in that moment. Now, in that case, Jesus is kind of, he's, he's making a different case there. He's saying, that's all the glory that they're going to get. <laughs> and and if, if you want more glory than that, that lasts longer than just those few seconds, then you're going to have to pray in secret. And you'll receive glory from the Father. That's a glory that lasts for eternity. And so he's making that case there. But in this case, as, as what Albert was just saying, Jesus is pointing specifically to his Father. This isn't just for someone to heighten their own honor, give themselves glory. He's doing this for a purpose, and it is specifically to bring people to, to his Father and to show people the glory of his Father. So that's a really good point. What else? Yeah, like Gamaliel or... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so he, he, didn't, he probably didn't go through the same kind of schooling that Paul did, but, because he is just the son of a carpenter, but even at 12 years old, he's showing a pretty heightened knowledge as he's asking questions that even made those teachers, those that were skilled in the law think interesting, <laughs> you know? And so uh, that says something about Jesus, Jesus's education um, being just a lowly carpenter's son. He knows what he's talking about. <laughs> um, maybe there's some encouragement there. Uh, well, at least for me, but <laughs> anyway, um, what what do we learn maybe specifically about God's will? What what are some things that we might be able to learn here about God's will? I'm, I'm looking mainly at verse seventeen. And, and, and also, on the other side of the same coin, you're going to do God's will if you know it. <laughs> you know, I think it's interesting the way that he says this. He starts with, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching. If you're willing to do his will, what does that mean you're willing to hear but that very will that you're trying to do? If you want to do something for someone, you go and figure out their expectations. You go and figure out what they require, what they desire. And once you do that, then you're going to be able to act on it. And I think that's one of the main things that Jesus is, is saying here about God's will and, and about what he's doing. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. And so all of that's true. But I also think just like at the very end of verse 17, he's trying to indicate you don't just have to take my word for it. And we're about to look at the law of Moses, but you can look back at the very scriptures that you love and teach and hold and abide by. And you can see that this is not just some Joe Schmo coming into town and saying some interesting things, selling snake oil. This is somebody who is kind of repeating the same things you've always heard, but with authority, authority that they've never heard before. As I think it says in uh, maybe Mark, uh, the gospel of Mark, I can't remember right now. But uh, so someone who's speaking with more authority, someone who's maybe giving more clarity to it, maybe speaking it more powerfully because he understands it fully. Um, and so uh, and so just one point of application I think we need to take from this about God's will is um, like in what Paul says in Ephesians chapter five and verse 17. Are we able to know God's will? Are we able to learn it? Do we have the capability to learn God's will? Yes. Yeah. There was a couple heads shaking, but we got an audible yes. That's what I was looking for. Yes. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17, I, I, I will just say, I think the wording 
helps here because it's it's not just a command, it, it, it's, it's an expectation. In Ephesians 5, can someone read verse 17 for us? Ephesians 5 and verse 17, once you get there. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so it is a commandment that we're supposed to understand. But if it's a commandment, what that means is we're not completely unequipped or just completely inadequate to do that thing. Uh, I mean, it, it, God is giving us a command. When he gives us a command, it means, therefore, that's something that we do have the capacity to do and that we can uh, absolutely attain that. And so um, we could go to also to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, but the, the point stands. We can know God's will as because he has already made it so clear to us. Um, beyond that, we just see in these few verses here that they could tell, um, as we just said, what was from God, what wasn't, if Jesus was just selling snake oil, or if he was really teaching the truth. And um, we're going to see this more. But uh, I, li I like the word true, especially in the book of John. It comes up over and over in verse 18. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. I think he's giving just another proof, another evidence that, as, as what Albert was just saying, if I was just seeking for my own glory, that would be a very good proof <laughs> that I'm not this Messiah. But if I'm seeking the Father's, what does that prove? And so just keep that in mind as we continue on. But in verses 19 through 24, verses 19 through 24, why did Jesus bring up the law of Moses here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, it's not to say they weren't doing any sacrifices. It's just like in the days of Isaiah. They were do, giving all these offerings, giving all these sacrifices, but God says, this is vain because you may bring me something on this specific day, but every other day you're acting just like the rest of the pagan world. Uh, and so while the Jews may have been doing lots of things that were a part of God's will, they weren't really doing it because they were not acting the way that they were supposed to. They hadn't cultivated the kind of hearts that the law was supposed to cultivate. They wouldn't allow it to cultivate that kind of heart. And so, uh, yes, that they, they were not following it because they, when they see the law of Moses embodied, and they see the law of Moses actually come, not, not just embodied, but I mean the, what, what, what's that word? Um, really, it's, it's the law of Moses incarnate. Because Jesus says, I am the law and I am the prophet's. I didn't come to destroy them. I came to fulfill them. And so uh, it's not just he's emulating this well. I mean, he is the law and the prophets, and that's important. Um, so I think that's a really good point. What else? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, they could, and they, they probably would say, uh, I like that point, because they probably would say, uh, we are looking for the Messiah, but you're not. You're looking for your, your own crafted Messiah. You're looking for one that you would like. You're not looking for the one that the prophet spoke of or the law of Moses spoke of even. Uh, so that's a really good point. And so I, I, I just put those words up there, circumcision and then the Sabbath, because these were things that they held very closely or very tight in their hearts. But they, they didn't 
um, particularly like with circumcision, they didn't have the heart that was supposed to be circumcised, which was what circumcision was supposed to mean. Yes, it was a sign of that covenant between Abraham and, its, and his offspring and God, but it was supposed to mean something more than that. And even when you go back to Genesis chapter 17, when that circumcision happens, God even describes that. It's supposed to it's supposed to be a covenant, a sign of the covenant, but it's also supposed to be something that that cultivates a specific kind of heart. They did not circumcise their hearts. And so uh, I, I think he brings the, these things up just as, as what uh, Mr. Steve was saying, that you've you do not practice the law. Uh, because if you did, then you would know who I am. Now, finally, in verse 24, he says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. What, what can we take from this in terms of application for today? Yeah. So what does partiality mean? Yeah. And so there is a, and I think that even that could play a role when he says you need to judge with righteous discernment. He's not saying be blind, but I think he is speaking specifically about partiality, which James will talk about this uh, a good bit in his uh, epistle when he says that you need to make sure that, because God is not partial with anybody, um, but these people who are following after God, who are supposed to be emulating his very characteristics, they're showing much partiality for the rich and the poor. And so that could be partiality in a positive way, partiality in a negative way. And, and, and I only mean positive or negative. Some people would benefit from that. Others would not benefit. They would be disadvantaged by that. And so uh, I think a lot of this comes down to making sure that we don't come with that kind of skewed partial discernment, that we have to come with objective instead of subjective motives. So unlike the Jews at this time, they were seeking for their own kind of Messiah. They weren't seeking for the true Messiah. So... Yes. Yes. And they're specifically not seeing it for what it is. Because when, the, and, and, and he's not, and like you were saying, he's not saying that that's wrong that you circumcised on the eighth day or on a Sabbath day. I mean, they still needed to be circumcised. They needed to follow God's law, but they weren't have they were kind of objective there. But when it comes to Jesus doing something like that, oh no, this is the Sabbath day. Let let you know be healed on another day, as it would say in Luke chapter thirteen. And and so and so that's what I mean by partiality. They're willing to overlook, not overlook, but they're willing to have that kind of righteous discernment. Okay, this is God's law here. We're just trying to obey God's law. And so when they saw someone being circumcised on the Sabbath, they thought, okay, that's fine. We understand that. That's okay. But when Jesus comes in and does something greater and more important, they're not willing to have that same level of um, compassion, that same level of objectivity. And so very good point there. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's move on to now. This is where, for some reason, the slides weren't transferring over, but I did just put a little something there. <coughs> John chapter 7 and verse 32. And I'll just pick up in verse 32. It says, The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Therefore, Jesus said, For a little while longer I am with you. Then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and you will not find me. 
And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews then said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Is he not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? Is he? Um, what is this statement that he said, You will seek me and will not find me? And where, where I am, you cannot come. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, from uh, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, This certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, This is the Christ. Still, others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. Uh, and this is one of those moments where in the scriptures you see like some dramatic irony. The audience kind of can snicker at some of these things that they're saying because we're we, I mean, we, we know better as they say things like, well, we know that the Christ has to come from the descendant of David, check, and from Bethlehem, the village where David was, you know, another check. And, and they're just saying these things in ignorance. Um, but coming back to the beginning of the passage there, remember that in verse 31, they were still trying to discuss whether or not, and just continuing with this kind of division and conflict, they were discussing whether or not when the Christ comes, you know, how could anyone perform more signs than this man is doing? And this is still in the middle of his ministry. He's going to do a few more things. Um, but even just at this point, it's very clear that he has come from God and that these works come from God and not just from himself, as he's already said. Now, you continue on in this passage uh, in verses 32 and onward. Um, well, before we get to verse 37, because I do think that there's something interesting there, is there anything else that you would think we should highlight in verses 32 through 36? I know we can't hit everything, but I just want to make sure that there's nothing that you all might want to uh, mention. But in verse 37 specifically, he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. So he brings up this idea of living waters again. Where, where else has he talked about this in John? Yeah, the Samaritan woman, where she is at the well. They're, they're both, you know, supposed to be drawing water, and he makes another teaching about this spiritual application, waters of eternal life. Now, we'll talk more about this later on and maybe on Wednesday, but I think he's specifically making some allusions to something that Isaiah uh, in particular has said or prophesied about that might be very small detail as you're reading through that and as the Jews would have been reading through that, but then Jesus comes in and he says, I would like to show you a deeper meaning of this that maybe you overlooked. Um, and I think it's really beautiful how he does that, um, as particularly at this feast. But we'll talk more about that on, on Wednesday because I believe that our time is just about up. So <laughs> thank you for all the comments. It was a good discussion today. We'll pick up on Wednesday in the questions. Hey, buddy. <laughs> hey, did I tell you that a couple of my slides just didn't?